the open source creative podcast episode 48 open source ecology with martin jacobowski this is the open source creative podcast a podcast where i ramble on about creativity process and open source software i'm jason van gumster your host and driver on the road to creative freedom so this week we're talking with martin jacobowski from open source ecology we cover a wide assortment of topics from nuclear fusion to getting big accomplishments, big, big accomplishments, a project, no, big projects accomplished over the course of a weekend. And all of this is within the context of using open source tools to make open source machines and really open source businesses. And this is all um, partially in, in terms of making machines. So this is, this is, this is creativity. This is making, this is what it's all about. Um, there, there is a chance you may hear uh, bits of a thunderstorm and my oldest child laughing at a YouTube video in the background, but that's that's the world we're in right now, and hopefully it's not going to be too distracting. But in any case, um, it's ridiculously interesting stuff by talking with a ridiculously interesting person. Um, also, a bit of news and housekeeping before we get into the interview. Uh, the coolest bit of this was from Wilena McCulley, who sent me an email. And feedback. Actually, she sent me probably... Um, one of the kindest emails I've received about the podcast or actually just about anything. Uh, she uses a whole slew of open source tools for doing planetarium work. And a lot of them are the same creativity tools we talk about all the time here. So, but she's using them for, for space stuff, or at least looking at the space because it's planetarium. So if you get a chance, I'd suggest you go over and take a look at the neat things she's doing over at um, fossdome.com. That's F-O-S-S dome.com. In other news, I've managed to, or I've sort of finally gotten around to getting the show on feeds for other places. So it's not just my RSS feed and, and, and Apple Podcasts, but you can also now find it on gpotter.net, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. I tried Stitcher, but they didn't really like my RSS feed the way it was formatted for some reason, so I have to go back and dig into that and figure out what's going on there. But in the meantime, if you or happen to... If you or, happen, if you or anyone else you know happens to use any of these platforms... I'm there now. You can find us. Open Source Creative is there. Uh, and speaking of finding me and, and podcasts, I actually had the privilege of being a guest on another show, The Mintcast. Uh, I was invited there to talk about Blender stuff, and I had a great time. Uh, and actually, it's, a, it's, it's about three hours worth of show. So they split it up into two pieces. The first part just got aired this week. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And then the next part, which is more in-depth Blendery and animation stuff, that actually gets posted next week. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but back to talking about the show. Again, I don't have any real interest in sponsors or subscription things, but I do pay for my own hosting and time to produce the show. So if you like it and you want to help me cover those costs, I do write books and have a little merch and stuff on uh, for sale on the site. Just go to the resources menu on opensourcecreative.org and see if anything there appeals to you. Whew, that's probably the longest intro I've done in a long time. In any case... How about we get to that interview now? Oh, we're going to toast marshmallows, are we? Could be. Better. All right, everybody. Today we have a guest. We have an interview. We have a guest in an interview. <laughs> With me, we have Martin Jacobowski from the Open Source Ecology Project. Is it? We go with project. Project. Yeah. project. project yeah. Um, and and he's here to talk to us. Actually, basically all about that. So I we'll go ahead and you tell us about ourselves. About not ourselves, yourself, Martin. Okay. So yeah. I'm open source ecology. So we're working on essentially open source blueprints for civilization. It's a pretty ambitious project started on like 2004, when, as soon as I got out of uh, the university grad school in fusion physics. And uh, wh one thing I discovered in my program is that I was useless. So after finishing the PhD program, I was all revving up to do good world work. But uh, I felt the, the farther I went into my studies, the more useless I felt. And certainly when I got out out of the program, I was studying fusion energy. I wanted to do something concrete for making a better world and um, started the open source ecology project, essentially about what it means to apply open open collaborative principles to developing 
basically an operating system for society. How do we create a society that collaborates as opposed to competes or just ha goes through tremendous amounts of comp competitive waste? Because one thing I noticed that actually made me start the project during the university time was I couldn't talk openly to others about my work. We had some hot work. I mean, it was fusion energy stuff, um, turbulence, crazy stuff. But um, when I noticed that, I thought, wow, this is that's interesting. And I was thinking about, well, uh, that's definitely preventing me from going where I need to in terms of educating myself and working openly with others, communicating, learning. And I thought if that if that happens even at the public institution at, at our universities, I thought this must be a pervasive problem. So so I, I was looking into that. I found out about Linux and open source software and then thought about, well, what would it look like if we applied that to hardware to to generally to how we do things in society. So that's that was the origin of the project. Right on. Well, so I'm going to back up just a second there. So um, you're, you 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 stepped away from from fusion, which like granted I'm I don't have my, my studies are nowhere near that. Um, but you know, you, when someone talks about studying that that like that, that is the mindset that is the sort of help the world with with this this with fusion power sort of thing oh, yeah. and like to to I guess that, that is that so the the sort of lockdown nature yeah. is that kind of what pushed you in that direction okay, or was it just so, like it's going slow so okay so there's a big point about uh, during the fusion program I learned about what appropriate technology really means I was initially interested in renewable energy and I thought oh yeah now so I was interested in solar I studied that a little bit undergrad and I did a thesis actually on uh, increasing the efficiency of solar cells. And then I thought, oh yeah, next thing, fusion. Well, what if we could make our own suns on a planet? Wouldn't that be awesome? Great. So as soon as I got into the program, I got decked with um, a bunch of theoretical studies and, and found pretty quickly that uh, the stuff that we're studying is very far from reality yet. And in fact, I mean, it's the running joke is it's going to be 10 years in the future. It always was and it always will be. <laughs> but um, that's the idea there is, I mean, there's some fundamental physics issues. It's, it's a really hard problem, but it made me think. It made me think, well, what about stuff that already exists, like the so solar power that throws at us 10,000 times more power than we already use? Why not go back to that? So uh, what happened was I actually was started doing outreach about fusion energy. And I got questions like yours. Okay, so how good is this? Is it, you know... What's the benefit to humanity? And of course, one, one, one answer was that, well, it's not here yet. But a second question that people asked was, well, what about the radioactivity? Because actually, that, that, that issue you still have to resolve. This is, this is nuclear. It's not like nuclear fission, which is much more polluting. But fusion does still have the untractable issue of high energy neutrons making radioactive anything they come in contact with. There is no physical law that allows you to negotiate that that we know of. There will be neutrons and there will be radioactivity. So people started asking that question and I started thinking, yeah, hmm, that's interesting. They're actually right. This is not here yet. It's it's not not going to be an appropriate technology if we do do it. And, and the one thing that bothered me about it is that it would be another hugely centralized power source. I was just about um, to mention that's, a, that's a, that totally central centralized distribution. It's not yeah. not decentralized at all. Yeah, so that's um, that's the story on a fusion. Thinking about appropriate technology uh, made me think that well, this is not it. Uh, and then I started studying, just kind of uh, get on my own path in terms of looking for what really is meaningful and important. Very cool. And so you ended up taking your way to was it? Was it it's northern U.S. Minnesota? No, that was yeah, Wisconsin yeah. University, Wisconsin. Wisconsin Madison. That's the okay. fusion program. Yep. Cool. Um, I, I, for anyone, by the way, you should go check out open, open source ecology.org. There's actually a lot of that information there. And this TED Talk is really good, too. So you should check that out. Um, yeah. But there's also stuff on there that I have questions about. So one of the biggest projects for open source ecology, as far as I can tell from the website, is the, 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 the blueprints for, for, for civilization, mm -hmm. right? These, these machines that, that yeah. um, you're prototyping and putting plans out for. And there, there's a listing for them here on the site. I yeah. was just looking at it before we, yeah, so before we 50, started. Basically take 50 of the most important machines that we think it takes for modern life to exist. Everything like a tractor, a circuit maker, production equipment, renewable energy equipment, a car, even a house. I mean, that's a 
that is a technology we live with. So looked at selecting some of the most critical technologies that will allow anybody to prosper. And the idea there is, let's talk about appropriate technology, how technology truly serves human needs so that we're not spending most of our time just trying to make a living, but prospering. So that's one of the myths. Uh, the myth of technology is still here. It's like, uh, it says that, oh yeah, our life is absolutely easier and we can all relax at the beach. But no, I mean, the with the more advanced technology, it seems like we're working harder and harder. And part of that is the how things break down, like this planned obsolescence and other issues, just issues in the way technology is made, proprietary, competitive, not lifetime design, that needs to needs to change. Otherwise, we're always trying to keep up with the technology instead of technology serving us. Well, and there's there's also the 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 efficiency barrier, right? So the 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 myth is that when tech, when you have a technology that gives you more time to do stuff, you're you're magically going to have more time to do stuff. Which what what that basically means is, no, you're going to use the same amount of time just doing different stuff. Yeah. Um, and and so you you end up doing just as much, if not more, work based on the the technology making you more efficient. Yeah, and and the idea there is we, we kind of have to stop and think about that a little bit and think about what our true needs are. And first of all, but at the same time, I mean, most of the world right now is still deprived of that very basic productive technology. So that's the other area to address, allowing access to a modern standard of living anywhere in the world. So yeah. of, of these 50 different machines or technologies, um, I, there's there's a I didn't get the number here. How many are, there's 50, on the web page? There's fifty there's total, 50. but on the page you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, in pro, oh, that's just in prototype stage. I'm looking at the, yeah, prototype. the prototype. There's a you can look at so on our we we, we uh, have a wiki open source ecology dot org slash wiki. You can look at the state of completion. There's an infographic. So we prototyped about twenty five or so of the machines already. We're busy. Um, getting products out into the marketplace. It's actually a lot of the work to date has been around prototyping. And right now we're at the stage where we're shifting to, okay, let's do some business development so that we can bootstrap fund the project. Because once again, in open source, you have to start talking, well, who's going to pay your bills? At some point, you're going to have to create meaningful revenue models. So we're really shifting to the enterprise development aspects these days. Well, then you also talk about, I guess you would need to talk about the, the tools to make these tools, right? I mean, yeah. you guys have a, a, a 3D printer that you've, yeah. you have designed. Actually, you're selling it now, right? Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. But so, there's also the, the raw materials. It's not just going to be made out of ABS or PLA. There's also metal right. that's involved with that. And then, you know, if you're, if you're making a, a house or whatever, you know, you have the yeah. raw materials, you get the wood, but you also have to have, you know, saws or, or hopefully yeah. power tools to put it together. Yeah. Yeah. So the Global Village construction sets, set operates on different levels. So one is uh, you've got production tools that can make machines, but also you have to talk about materials, as you said. So, for example, the capacity to melt down steel in an induction furnace and roll it into virgin metal, that's part of the set. And then you can take your precision machining equipment and then make finished parts like engines and hydraulics. So that is all in there. You have to address the the materials issues and actually we have the, the most advanced technology in a set is is uh, aluminum extraction from clay because uh -huh. well, uh, clay is one of the most abundant or uh, aluminum is the third most abundant element is it i think the third most abundant element in the earth's crust and what if you can create technology that allows you to do that on a decentralized scale so think about essentially take any parcel of land and take the natural resources that are there like sand to make silicon and PV and semiconductors or aluminosilicate, which is clay to make aluminum. So think about that whole ecology of how we do that in a way that's uh, that creates a circular economy is good for the environment and everybody wins. So instead of that huge centralization, uh, then we can talk about distributed economies to benefit more people. And so these pieces these these machines the, the plans for them they're under the what license are there there's a creative, yeah, commons, creative license? commons by share alike so viral clause on those software is typically gpl but yeah just uh make access available to anybody we're very particular about the nonsense with the non-commercial clauses like a lot of people these days call their 
open source-ish projects open source, even though they're under the non-commercial licenses, which is a lot, there's just a lot of um, illiteracy in terms of what open source really means. But yeah, we're absolutely uh, committed to that. We go a step further. We also talk about the, the step beyond the blueprints and that is enterprise. So what we design is not only that you can, you can have the open source blueprints for the printer, but how do you run an enterprise for producing these printers? So mm. that is the production engineering, the facility layout, tooling, bills of materials, supply chain, and all that. We document all of that too, because we're interested in a world where there's more entrepreneurs, more capacity everywhere, and we actively train people to be our competition. We think that is good. The more people you have, the more collaborators you have. We look at people as collaborators, not, not to the enemy. So. Uh, that concept is called distributive enterprise, and we've published that since about 2013, um, and we really stick to that. But we really don't know of anybody else who does this kind of work where they're actually actively promoting others and training others to get into the in open source enterprise. That's that's a big deal. Right, I think it's yeah. extremely important. I think that's the next evolution of the human economy towards distribution. Uh, we and know you'll, all these things. Yeah, and you'll you'll see product. Yeah, and I mean, you'll see this in in the the um, on on the creative side of things, especially if you look at like like audio um, and 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 some like photo and images as well. You'll see, yeah, it's released under a Creative Commons license, but it's it's non commercial and no derivatives. Well, right. what's what's the what's the point? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it just blows my mind because I mean, if you think about it, you know, just stop and think about it. It's like wow, just think about how many people are reinventing the wheel over and over again and that's you know that's how i felt uh so going back to my phd i thought okay i can't really talk to other people i gotta go in and maybe research it myself and just repeat something that people have already done why and then apply that to okay for example the tractor that that i i bought that kind of started the whole notion of lifetime design where the tractor broke i paid to get it repaired then it broke again and pretty soon i was broke too like I talk about in my TED talk, right? I mean, to well, make even... your design closed source that no, everybody, so many different companies have to compete to reinvent the wheel instead of collaborating to make something bigger, better, solve a bigger problem. That is what blows my mind. That's that's what we're passionate about: solving bigger problems. Let's get together and solve bigger problems. Yeah, they were talking about that with um, was it John Deere? has oh like yeah closed yeah, firmware yeah. that you know yeah. if you it's the sort of the the i think i forgot which state it was but they were really trying to push through a sort of right to repair um clause and that that yeah. got a lot of like lobbying pushback on that um so. yeah yeah i mean you see that, that that was an interesting example where if you buy a tractor that you can't even you know fix it or look into the software I mean, you don't really own it. It's really about who owns you, who owns your equipment. Well, yeah. speak, speaking about software, so two parts of this. One is the, the software that you use for for the designs, but the other the other part is um, before I get to that, mm. is there are, are there besides as part of these machines are are there software components? Absolutely, sure. Like, of course, uh, the three D printing uses Marlin, all of that for. The brick press, for example, the compressed earth block press that we make, there's Arduino code that runs it. So yeah, uh, if you've got mechatronic devices, yeah, there's code that control code. That's a common occurrence. Right on. And so, but the the, the bulk of these plans are what, FreeCAD? Is, FreeCAD, is that's FreeCAD? it. So FreeCAD now is uh, at a state where it's, it allows us to do all that we do. What, what we actually are doing with FreeCAD is because it's open source, we're creating new design workbenches. So right now, you can download the, the 3D printer design workbench in FreeCAD, and you can start designing different iterations of our 3D printer. And that's the beauty. That's something we could never do with proprietary software. For sure, for sure. Well, that, and that's actually kind of, FreeCAD is one of those things, I'm a, I'm a Blender guy, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, so FreeCAD is this. It feels weird saying this because Blender has the history of being this this uh, painful interface to get around. But now that I have my 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 whole head wrapped around it, trying yeah. to like shift gears back to more of a CAD mentality and and working with FreeCAD, um, there's 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 some weird stepping off points for for me because it's you know you you before. It, 
I guess let me put it this way. When I typically go in, I typically go in and I just start sort of scribbling and making. FreeCAD, for me, feels like you have to be a bit more planned in how you start working on it. Is that uh -huh. an accurate uh, description? Well, I mean, so the FreeCAD work workflow for me is the sketcher where you really get to doodle in that and then extrude that. So um, now I'm also not a not a blender guy, but I, I am trying to learn blender uh, basically where you take, yeah, you start with your blocks and just start manipulate, I guess, uh, sculpting them. But I do find like with the FreeCAD sketcher, you can design any kind of complex geometry in 2D and then make it into 3D. And then you can take any of the sides and make features upon features until you get any kind of geometry that you like. So conceptually, that's that's a very simple concept I can wrap my head around and it's it's, it can design anything, yeah. You know what? You th I think you just just cracked it for me because I I tend to start if I'm I'm in a program that's naturally 3D. I'm going to start working in 3D on it. But yeah. starting starting with the 2D sketch and, and extruding it out and playing with it makes a lot more sense. So yeah, yeah. That's, now, uh, I, now I have more stuff to play with. <laughs> well, actually, uh, you know, people that is a barrier, uh, especially with people who have experience with CAD, because they're saying, no, I'm not going to learn free CAD because it's it's different and weird. But the thing is, we have more success with novices learning FreeCAD. Like, I can teach somebody to do the basic workflow to design any geometry in about an hour. And they can actually start producing things for 3D printing, or whatever. We've done that. Yeah, you, you actually see that with a lot of open source uh, packages. Is that if you, anybody who already has a workflow in mind, you know, you see, yeah. you see this with like Photoshop and someone trying to pick up GIMP or somebody who knows Illustrator trying to pick up uh, Inkscape. And like, they're trying to... Yeah, like ham-fistedly work their their old workflow into yeah. this other tool, and it, it's not it's a it does the same thing, but it works and thinks differently. And yeah. Yeah. I I apparently fell into that exact same trap myself just now. Curses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think uh, that's interesting because um, like so we have OSE Linux, which is basically the distribution with all the software that we use. But I find that it's useful. To just like any any piece of software will have okay this is you have to conceptualize it in your mind and get your mind around okay what is the basic principle of how that works the workflow works and then once you get that then learning the mechanics of that is okay you just go through the motions but you have to stop and and kind of think about that and get that around your head and that way you can actually learn so many different packages and be fluent in all of them you just have to understand like the basic principle behind them so oh, actually hold on a second Do you guys have a Linux distro? I didn't even see Yeah, we do. We have OSC Linux 1.0 and then 2.0 that's just coming out like next week or next two weeks. Is that so spun off of... So say that again? Uh, so is that is that a spun off another distro? Did you oh, yeah, yeah. So actually or... we used we built it on top of Ubuntu for the first one and we're going off Linux Mint for the second one. But it's basically a distribution that's got all the software, including, for example, like the FreeCAD workbenches that we created. It's already preloaded. So you don't have to spend all this time configuring, downloading like 10 or 20 programs when you work with us. Basically, we want it to be like if we do so we do large scale collaborative design. If we do that, we want to give somebody the USB stick and they, they have all the software that we always use right there. And then we can get busy collaborating. And do you use just the, the, the Mint or Ubuntu uh, repos or do you have your own sort of repo stack as well? Um, yeah, we're, we just download the right packages, create the thing. We, we don't really have, we don't have that yet. We don't have like a full repo. We just pretty much download the stuff off the web and make our can our distro. Yeah, That's super. Well, actually, because yeah, you were talking about these large scale collaborative things, and on your website, you guys had a was. Let me look at my notes real quick to make sure that I I wrote it over here. Oh yeah, so you're the Steam Camp. Yeah, um, you had that back in March. Did that act, that happened right around the whole COVID thing? Did that actually yeah. happen or? It did happen in March. I actually went out to New Zealand. There was a session in the United States. So, um, but since COVID, we, we quit that since we can't do that in person. But we are actually going to run another one in September where it's we're just going to ship out the OSE dev kits, including the 3D printer kit, to people so that we can do that remotely. So basically learn, learn to design things for 3D printing, learn to build your own 3D printer, learn how to make your own microcontroller, do a little programming maybe a little power electronics experiment. So yeah, just hands-on skills that you can use to make real things. Very. So do you have these camps? You ha and you, they're obviously they're, they're, they're well attended. Where, 
where does where's the community hang out? That uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a dev team. Uh, we have our OSC. Maybe like if you talk about con ongoing communication, that will be open source ecology workshops Facebook page. That's probably the best place. And we're just actually setting up discourse forums. We had other forums that we kind of trashed a couple of years ago because they got out of control. But yeah, we're, we're getting back on discourse to get that community going back again. Yeah, discourse is, is really nice. Um, yeah. Coming from someone that managed one forum in, in PHPBB and then moved over to vBulletin, discourse is like head and shoulders, yeah. way more tools for pre preventing exactly what you're talking about, preventing the forum from either being overly inundated with with spam and 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 the wrong things or just sort of toxic attitudes that that tend to yeah. go with it so because discord's really great for that so i have I'd yeah 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 worth doing that i think we can do a lot to basically like make that correlate to the wiki quite closely so that we use the forums as a way to to uh really push the development effort forward quite a bit well, so how how big? I mean, you don't have the forum, but you have the Facebook side of things, and you have, uh, you know, you, you said you're you're basically everywhere in, in sort of the hardware space and the open source hardware space and, and those sort of things. Yeah. Um, I guess do you, do you have a sense of the scale of of the community? I mean, yeah, I mean, see, we we don't have uh, like a really established organization as it's a bunch of people that come and go. It's a volunteer run organization, so there's like. We have like three or four full-time equivalent in terms of volunteer effort. I'm absolutely full-time on this. My partner is doing Open Building Institute work, which we're collaborating on. But that's the thing we're aiming to crack right now. And we just started our program to train people to run OSE chapters in different locations. We actually have one person from South Africa applying right now. But the perennial thing has been you've got volunteers that come and go, you know, you're going to who's paying your bills is the idea right so right now we're actually uh for the osc chapters we're training people okay how do you run and build the 3d printers that you can produce that you can run workshops around that you can run the steam camps with so we're really getting serious at the the livelihood part because after all it's got to be the mass creation of right livelihood that's going to make this project grow because right now we're not we're not growing uh like i would like um and we're addressing that by really pushing the enterprise side forward i meant i mentioned that the, the products right, so, right. You, so you start with a full tool chain like we're starting with a 3d printer that's a established technology but the good thing is we're going to be producing parts for example for the cnc torch table for cutting metal or the filament maker shredders uh, shredder parts or rubber tracks for the tractors that's the kind of stuff we talk about so we start with the printer and that that we're getting to a fully developed product so our next steps on it actually is a four by eight, four by four by eight foot large scale three D printer. Because a lot of the technology we design is scalable, like the motion system, universal axis. You can scale that. The, we pay a lot of attention to scalability and modularity. So right. if you understand the pattern for the small printer, use bigger parts and similar design pattern to make a much bigger one. So for example, we've made like a four by eight torch table already uh, with the printed parts. Uh, that were scaled up and the whole motion system was scaled up and things like that. So that's there's a whole product ecology of how you go from, so you start with the 3D printing, you then go to the metal work, precision machining, and bootstrapping your whole technology set. Yeah. So so I guess that would that would that leads me in sort of the, the next thing is that so of 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 these designs that you that you have, mm -hmm. these machines that you have, there's 50 of them there. They're in various states. How soon do you think you'll have all uh, of them either in yeah. prototype or like as viable things. Okay. So this is the status, uh, uh, status, uh, status of completion page on a wiki. We're about 30% done. So one third, 2028 is the magic answer. So right now we're about one third, but that means a lot of work left. 2028 is essentially the cutoff we're set, setting to, okay, we're going to be done with whatever we have. Right now, we're spawning the larger collaborative development processes. Like, actually, right now, we're we're working on a major, major effort. And that, so let, let me talk about that for a second, because we're seeing that, okay, you can only do so much. We've been at it for a decade. We're like one third done. Initially, right. when I hit the TED Talk on the stage, I thought we'd be done in like two, 
two years because of all the flood of influx of people interested and so forth. But then you learn, oh, that's called management and enterprise and wasn't ready for that. <laughs> uh, so, so having upped my skill set on the enterprise side, we're really going at that. So the next step in our work is to address, when you think about it, what is happening with open hardware? There's not a lot of good example of effective open hardware product releases, and that's that's the perennial issue. It's hard to get people to show up. Uh, so how do you motivate people to do that? And we're saying, okay, let's create an event. And so this is what we're planning for about uh, next summer, not not this summer, but next summer. So an event, we're going to handpick 2,000 people with a collaboration architecture of people for the right right skill set and roles to deploy the open source micro house. So it's the seed home. Like I actually live in a seed home. This is the seed eco home. I can send you a link on that. It's a nice, pretty house. Yeah, sure. Uh, but we started the Open Building Institute and we learned about modular building construction. So we're going to take that project to completion and the release of a viable thousand square foot house that you and a friend can build in one week for $50,000. That so like this event is going to be a three-day weekend event. We get we gather all the people and develop. It's largely documentation, but everything around the business side. So how do you develop the website, marketing, copy, distribution, and all all the assets for starting a business? And we're going to publish that. So imagine two thousand people, twenty-four hours. So it's twenty-four thousand hours, twelve man years compressed into a weekend. Can we do it? So that is a huge experiment but the goal is to address the thing that we're saying at the end of this we're going to release this product so this is a crazy experiment but this is literally what needs to happen because none of them it's so rare that a hardware project gets to the finish line yeah there there is a the giant sort of logistical thing with um with managing that large of a team but um what one of the things that i found from from stuff that crazy stuff that I've done in the past um, yeah. that got knocked out in a weekend was, yeah, people, especially when you're dealing with people who are volunteers, you really need to you do things that, that that value their time, right? And so if you can do things that are, um, well, if you, if, you, if you can say, all right, your commitment is limited to this weekend, people are way more interested, way more willing to say, all right, I've got 48 hours, I can throw at that and yeah. throw as much as I can into it. It's the same thing you see with like the the sort of high intensity interval training workouts where it's like, oh, you can do anything for 20 seconds, right? Oh, well, then they're, they're huffing and puffing at the end of it. But <laughs> but that's that's the sort of thing where um, you get this this that sort of sprint mentality. Everybody yeah. gets on board as long as you have sort of all of the infrastructure and logistics in place, so that yeah. when you inevitably run into like a hiccup or a trip or or fall, or or because it's going to happen. But if you have the the, yeah. the systems in place to handle that, especially with that number of people, then you just sort of keep striding on, and everybody's got a lot of energy to make these things happen. Yeah. Um, what was your experience with the event? What what happened there? So it, I've did it four times in the past. It's been a long time since I did. It. So I, there's the uh, the 48 hour film project. I don't know if you're familiar with this. No, no. This, I, don't, I don't even know if they're still doing it. I'm pretty sure they are. But this was well over a decade ago that I was doing it. Um, the 48 hour film project is what it sounds like. You have two days, a weekend, basically, to produce a film. Um, okay. okay. I had the I had the crazy and the film. Well, I had the crazy idea of okay, I'm gonna, we're going to produce an animation in that period of time, um, and, and well, that of course. But the idea is we're going to produce an animation that period of time. the The catch there is that the minimum running time, the minimum minimum length of that film, has to be four minutes long, mm. which in animation terms is an eternity. It's a mm-hmm. lot to produce in um in such a it's a lot of footage to produce in such a short period of time, and ended up I, I did it four separate years in a row and we, we finished it twice out of those four but we ended up with a team of like 30 some people spread out internationally um mm. and we were broadcasting what we were doing live we had all sorts of cool things working wow where, yeah i mean the only downside and i'm going to tell you this right now the only downside is that i really enjoy the 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 art of animation and doing animating and rigging but because it, i sort of um, was was leading the project. Um, I didn't get to do the actual work part as much. I spent a lot of that time managing traffic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you when you when you act as a producer for a sprint like that, where you're trying to get so much done in such a period, a short period of time, yeah. you 
you end up doing a lot of control, like delegating and getting people to do the right thing at the right time. And then if something drops through, okay, you work really fast to sort of fill in that gap by yourself yeah. and then, then move on to the next thing. Um, well, but, uh, maybe we, you can help us collaborate because actually video production is going to be part of that. So in that 24 hours, there's going to be a big effort of animation and video to get the, the prototype builds. We're going to build the thing, all the prototype modules in that time. So we're going to need video and animation for explainers and all of that. So maybe you can help us. Yeah, I mean that. Let, look me up if you, was that next year. Well, we we can talk about that. That'd be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Well, that's because that was that was actually in in realm of my next question is because like how are you going to get these things be made? Because obviously if you've been doing it for ten years and you're thirty percent the way there, you know, mm-hmm. you're either yeah. going to be keep you're either going to keep waiting or you're going to have to do something like sprints or, or something yep. along those lines. So I was curious about how that was going to work out. Um, well, that, that is exactly that. So now think about how do you coordinate much larger events that yield a product? So the experiment for next year, that's going to be a big, big experiment. It's, it's all about enterprise development and compressed time. So right now we're getting the 3d printer enterprises up and going. So that's bootstrap funding and we simply, as you said, we have to accelerate. So we're looking for ways of how exactly do you do that? It's it's not an easy thing. Like when you're dealing with hardware, it's much more, It's I'd say it's like a thousand or a hundred thousand times more complex than software. Um, but yeah, um, we're working on it and, and we're giving ourselves till 2028. So we've got about eight years left. Uh, but to finish, meaning to the level of a distributed distributive enterprise for each of the projects you can make a living i'm building a car building houses building tractors building 3d printers or whatever so all those have to be turned into enterprises so i guess the related to to that effort and related to getting that to happen yeah um a a lot of people who listen to this show we have people who are who are i have a pretty interesting sort of spectrum of people listening we have everything from people who are really like or just they're just interested in open source and, and everything dealing with with open culture and those sort of things mm-hmm. we have people who are who are very interested in just technology and and those sort of things of course you know it's the open source creative so we have a lot of people who do creative work who you know write video animation music these sorts of things yeah. so yeah the other two sort of because it's open because it's, it's open source ecology because they have the technology because they have the um the the, the open source angle on that that where they fit those 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 sorts of people where they fit is great but on the creative side if so, if somebody listening to the show for instance was interested in helping you out what what do you need the most what's what's um aside from making like just making it happen what sort of what sort of skills do you do you think if if i wanted to contribute to to this project where where would i slot in right where what what could i do Unfortunately, it's business development, or fortunately, business development and marketing, because we've got so many different prototypes and things that we have done. For example, the house, that's ready to be a product. And that's why we're doing that, uh, productizing that next summer in our extreme first extreme enterprise event. The extreme enterprise concept, by the way, is like that's only like a month old here. But we're really focusing on, okay, studying what we have done, what is missing. And it's clearly the the finished product, the enterprise, the people showing up, but showing up to get to that final product. So we've got the houses. I can send you links. People can look at We've got the micro tractor. We've got the tractors that we have built. We've got the 3D printers, the houses, uh, CNC circuit mill, all these things that are ready to be turned into good businesses. And that's the level we're working at right now. So there's copywriting, there's marketing, there's product product development at this point i mean we've got an amazing amount of substance for i mean the technology works and the the modular kind of uh lego set like design where we make we focus on modules instead of finished machines that gives us extreme flexibility like for example with a tractor the same principles we use to build a tractor we build a backhoe or a bulldozer um or a bobcat or whatever so so it's a very generative set it's it's about taking that to the last last mile of product development i mean that's really the the thing and but that's a huge thing that requires every just about every job from creatives to business development marketing copywriting i mean technology. so I, one of the things that that strikes me is what about making the making things with these things right and so yeah 
from the art side of things, you talk about a brick press. I'm like, okay, what if I what if I put a mold in that and I I do a a brick that's you know making a mold of whatever maybe make a 3d sculpture print out a mold for that and then do the brick press with that um you have a cnc on here you know it's cnc you can do cool manufacturing stuff but um maybe you can make just cool sort of a a, a wall relief sort of thing those mm-hmm. sort of things are i mean i mean i don't, I don't know it, it's it sort of strikes me a little bit as as um Granted, there's the there's the the blueprint for society where where you're you have the functional side of it, but if, I mean there's art there's 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 doing things that's yeah. not necessarily intended for. So like if you want to take you know you're talking about uh, aluminum extraction or even like like smelting. Oh, I'm, if I if I if I had the the facilities for 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 melting steel at home and making crazy stuff out of steel, there that 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 that's that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, what you're saying is that there's the opportunities are endless, right? Uh, in, in terms of more artistic products as well. Once again, like in the, in the world of business, everything is nothing, right? You have to focus on, okay, let's develop one thing after another. An idea is um, what we're really working on is creating that collaborative literacy where uh, we found that one of the biggest blocks is uh, for collaborative development is that it's hard for a person to imagine that together there's enough for everybody the abundance mindset that oh yeah we can all do better doing that so that's one of the things we're really struggling with like why isn't the obvious happening like uh, just amazing enterprise development just take take within our project the stuff we already have like say the 3d printer um to give you an example uh, 2008 when we first did the brick press i thought okay once we publish this, this is going to go wild people are going to start massive enterprise everywhere and no it doesn't work like that there's a big difference between here's a prototype ready to be a product and and then actually starting an enterprise productive enterprise either house building or building machines that's a much much bigger journey so well, yeah then the the challenge there is the same yeah. challenge you actually run into with on like if I'm making animation for television production or I'm making an illustration for, for magazines or a website, you know, the, 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 the argument always of why to use open source tools can never just be the accessibility conversation, which is unfortunate because that's a big component of it, right? That's, that's, that's like one of the big things, accessibility, avoiding vendor lock-in, being able to have this decentralized thing where you always have on your guaranteed ownership of what you do. But yeah. from, from this, this, the business side of things, when you're doing freelance work or those sort of things, it's like, Oh, I mean, you know, I, I charge this much and whatever, yeah, I can just pay for Photoshop to to do whatever. I can just pay for Maya to do whatever I need to do because that's the business side of thing. And on on the, you know, you're going to talk if you're talking about like the brick press, it's like all right. So you have people who are yeah, you, you could buy bricks or you could buy a an industrial scale brick press. Um, what what's I guess that's the the question. That, not to be businessy, I've been uh, businessy, uh, is but like the value proposition. So the fact that you can do this um, on your own. That has to is is that going to be enough yeah. to to, to no, launch that out? See, that's not that's not it. That's we're competing with industry standards. That means we're going to build things that are cheaper, better, faster than the normal product. So our brick press has to produce as many bricks as the commercial brick press, but we do it at one fifth the cost. Our tractor has to have the same horsepower and capacity. Our printer has to be be as good or better so we're not talking about uh like the diy case is one application you can take our blueprints and make this stuff but the other thing is starting enterprise where you're producing things on an open market like a lulzbot or prusa 3d printer those are open source commercial products so we're talking about that 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 stuff that's good enough to start an enterprise with does that i got you yeah yeah okay and so i guess that's 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 really that the the differentiator then is is I guess, yeah, getting, getting, because it just took me half of this conversation to, to, to wrap my head around that. Well, you have to wrap your head around. This is cheaper, better, faster, stronger for the same products. That's why for me, it's like, my mind is blown. Why do not people understand that? Um, Well, and that's, that's the classic thing we've had on the open source side for, for, for over, you know, for decades now is like, so you, so I get this for free. What's the catch, right? That's a natural inclination. So it's, what's the catch? What's the, what's the thing? And like, usually, and this is, I think where I think for your, for, for, for your project, building up the community is, is such an important component of that. And really yeah, yeah. having, having the community with home, because 
that's that's the if there's anything that there's, there's a gotcha in all of that it's where's the support come from right and so from an enterprise standpoint yeah, yeah. i'm going to provide commercial support for whatever for for the 3d printer that i produce or for the tractor that i produce for my community and those sorts of things um and then if i scale that out then i'm going to be the one on the hook for for providing that support but who's going to support yeah. that person right and being able to I, that's where i think the the value of having that that community really fleshed out is going to help absolutely so that the community definitely can help in the support side absolutely through forums or otherwise but yeah we have to be very deliberate about building those functions into the businesses yeah mm -hmm. very cool but i mean so the thing to figure out here is like that that we're struggling with is like what are the incentives because clearly you can get better faster cheaper stronger kind of deal um but it's hard to convince people that that's the real case well we're struggling with 200 years of industrial history where everything has been proprietary for one and people think that competition or just like patents or whatever is a law of nature. No, it's not. So well, let me go back to the to the ultimate incentive. What if you can collaborate on a development process where you're guaranteed that you're going to have that product at the end of the day? So it's like basically like pre-funding a Kickstarter or whatever. But that's exactly what we're trying to tap with the extreme enterprise model. So the 2,000 people that are going to participate in that, guess what each one of them like what is the strongest motivation the, the most true stakeholder in that process is the person that's going to get that house so those two thousand people are going to get their house for fifty thousand dollars that uh -huh. is the ultimate catch do you think we can attract the two thousand people to do that i think so it's going to be a big organizational process a lot of a uh, scrum agile theory and extreme manufacturing theory put into practice uh, but that's a, that's an experiment w worth doing, for sure. Well, and I think I think the the those two thousand people. I think you're specifically going to need to be looking at um, sort of the people with with more of an entrepreneurial mindset, right? It's if 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 your your idea of of life is getting up, going to work for somebody else to do their thing, and then coming home and then doing something else. I don't know if that sort of mindset's going to well, fit with this, right? So the requirement for those 2,000 people are not an entrepreneurial mindset. It's a subject matter expertise. We're going to say, hey, you're the guy that does technical documentation or the blender guy that's going to do the exploded part animations for this house. Uh, we need you. You get this house at the end of the day that you can buy that we will do. There is an element of enterprise. And right now, we're currently thinking that out of those 2,000, there's going to be a crew of about 100 they're pursuing the enterprise track, meaning that they're going to learn more enough so that they can actually take this on as a business, producing these houses for others. Right now, all I know is that I will be with open source ecology, be learning that skill set so that we can train more people to do that. But the 2000 people, you're not, you know, to make, to get an entrepreneur, subject matter expert, super cooperator uh, in all those areas, it's harder. Right. You yeah. had the enterprise requirement. So here it's mostly like subject matter experts in all the different, the radical modular breakdown of the house into modules and then into the enterprise development modules. That's subject matter expertise. But yes, um, th that's a good question because uh, I was struggling with it. How do you, this does sound like an enterprise uh, layer event, but it's not really. The people were we're attracting to it is mostly stripped of that requirement because there's just not so many entrepreneurs out there I, i'd say yeah it's it's definitely more of a um there the entrepreneurial that mindset population is is overall a smaller subset of, of general human population yeah so yeah that trying to trying to trying to well here's the other tough part i guess is you said you're gonna do this next summer yep so have yep. you so so have you like officially announced that are you like we're in I, that's a lot of people to gather in and and yeah. less than a year we're gonna need a full team full team of about six people doing the recruiting vetting uh basically the role uh role architecture of that part so that is the thing we're gonna absolutely have to do uh there's a bit of work work ahead so the budget of hiring a few people full-time for like six months 
uh, in order to do that and getting the funding to do that. So those are the challenges in front of us. I think we'll be able to get the funding for that easily. Uh, but it, this is an impossible organizational challenge that nobody has done yet. Love well, it. I'm gonna I'm gonna look forward to seeing it happen. That'll be that'll yeah. be a, just even. It's one of those things where even even the effort of trying to do it, you're gonna there's there's gonna be so much to gain from just doing that. Um, so yeah. I'm I'm excited to see see where that goes. Um, we're we need some oh. innovation stuntmen to pave the way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the 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 crash test dummy of of is is basically where innovation lives. Um, so that that basically covers it for for, for what I had. You know, are there any questions that I didn't ask you that you wanted to like address or or anything about that? Um, no, I think we covered a pretty good deal. Um, I think we. I I want to definitely point people uh, whoever's watching this take a look at my four minute TED talk that summarizes the whole scope of what we're doing here. Because we only touched on a few of the sub subjects that we can talk about, but it's a big ambitious project to create a different operating uh, paradigm for how society works. Cool. When you get this thing, when you get the the um, the announcement that this thing is going on, definitely let me know so we can oh, get, the, get the word on that. That'd be great. Um, yeah. Where can people, besides, I guess, along with opensourcecology.org, where else can people yeah. find you on the internet nets and talk to you about stuff? Yeah, we've got our Facebook page, but if you want to get involved, there's a page on the wiki that's just getting involved. If you get an account on the wiki for editing, you'll get a follow-up with here's all the ways to get involved. But yeah, the, I mean, the thing we're trying to push forward right now in a big way, I said, is the entrepreneurial aspect. So here's the deal. If you want to learn how to build a 3D printer, for example, as an enterprise, we're the only guys in the world that are going to teach you that. Uh, none of the other companies do that. They, they don't teach their own competition, but we do that. So that's a pretty unique opportunity. And then there's the immersion training to actually start OSC chapters, building the 3D printers, running workshops. That's a business model that we've been doing for a decade. So uh, basically combining education and production and information in one kind of an enterprise package. But we invite you, I mean, if you want to see this project go forward, we've got enterprise substance. Come to us. We'll teach you how to do this. Start start an OSE chapter. Start producing the machines that we have. Um, join us. Very cool. Well, cool. Thanks for, thanks for coming yeah. on the podcast. And yeah. um, I'll be looking forward to see where this goes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jason, for the invite. And we'll talk. And that's the show. Big thank you to Marchin for taking the time to come and talk with us. I'm, uh, I'm pretty stoked to see what happens with that uh, extreme enterprise thing they're going to do next summer. I really want to see if that comes together and if they can pull that off. Even if they don't, it's going to be interesting to watch. So keep an eye on that. Maybe, just maybe you might be one of the people involved with making that project come to life. What kind of big weekend sprint style events have you been a part of? Did you use open source tools for that? Were you able to uh, share that with the rest of the world and, and, and do that? I want to hear about that. And the way you can do that is you can let me know. Uh, the easiest way is through email, podcast at opensourcecreative.org. But you could also track me down. Again, I'm Jason Van Gumster. I'm on all your favorite social media and some of the social media sites you're not so favorite about. I happen to be on all of them just because, you know, it's easier to find me. Uh, just look for Monster Java Guns or specifically for the podcast, OSS creative and when you find me tell me what you think i also have an email newsletter if you're interested sign up is very easy just go over to the contact section on opensourcecreative.org and do it there all right now it's time to get to work